afternoon. Welcome to our show. I'm your host, Melissa Ridgen. We're two days post-election in Canada. Voters gave Justin Trudeau's government another chance, but in a diminished capacity, a far cry from the majority government that he enjoyed in 2015. This time they have 157 seats. That's down from 184. Much of the support that they lost went to Andrew Scheer's Conservatives across Canada, who went from 99 seats to 121 seats, while the bloc made gains in Quebec, increasing from 10 seats to 32. It was a tough go for Yagmeet Singh's NDP, who went from 44 seats in 2015 to 24 seats now. But one of those seats was one in Nunavut, where three Inuk women battled for the seat. Mumala Kaka, a 25-year-old activist, originally from Baker Lake, she defeated former Conservative MP for the riding, Leona Aglukok, who finished second. And the Greens tripled their presence in the House of Commons, going from one seat to three. While on the West Coast, maybe one of the most watched ridings in this election, Vancouver Granville put party allegiances aside and elected Jody Wilson-Raybould, a member of the Weiwike Nation, who won that seat as an independent. She, of course, was the Attorney General uh, who was kicked out of Liberal Caucus for standing up against the PMO's office uh, on the SNC-Lavalin affair. Today we are starting this show, putting Vote 2019 in focus. After that we go to the East Coast, the Member 2 First Nation, on Cape Breton Island where a lobster fishing boat was set ablaze and $10,000 worth of traps ruined or stolen. And later on in the show we're going to, uh, to go to Oneida Territory in southern uh, Ontario where community members say tensions have flared to concerning proportions at a high school in London, Ontario. So we'd, of course, love to hear your thoughts on this, uh, at the results of the election, what it'll mean to you as an Indigenous person, what you hope happens with this new government in Ottawa. Our phone lines are open. You can call us toll-free at 1-877-647-2786. You can also tweet us at APTN in Focus. Before I introduce you to our guests, let's take a look at how the election shook down. The crowd gathered at the Liberal headquarters in Montreal projected the result long before the polls did. But when official word broke confirming Justin Trudeau's re-election, it brought the room to its feet. I have heard you, my friends. You are sending our Liberal team back to work, back to Ottawa with a clear mandate. The race between the Conservatives and the Liberals was tight, but the Liberals won a minority government by a slim margin. We will govern for everyone. Many say Trudeau's reconciliation efforts are unrivaled, though not everyone is satisfied with his pace. It is time to stop these violations once and for all without having to fight in court to ensure respect for basic human rights, AFN Regional Chief Ghislaine Picard said in a statement following the election. The story is to follow and the AFNQL will monitor this government closely. Meanwhile, Quebec Native Women says they're waiting for concrete action regarding the MMIWG inquiry's calls for justice. On fait quoi? avec les manquements pour la situation des femmes, la sécurisation des trois points que j'ai apportés. I want to invite uh, the Prime Minister to come sit down with the Longhouse people here and have an open discussion on what is going on here. In Ganesadage, Mohawk Territory, a resident's 12-day hunger strike persists amid demands for a meeting with the Prime Minister and action on land claims. But Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, Mark Miller, says Canadians must temper their expectations for immediate turnaround on more complex issues. This is a relationship that's been frayed for, for several centuries uh, and there's a lot of work to be done. Um, we need to do it respectfully with engagement in the community and that takes time. And while he did not directly address the Indigenous population of Canada during his celebratory speech, Justin Trudeau did say that he continues to further his work and continue to give voice to the voiceless and is ultimately being sent back to Ottawa with a very clear message. Now what remains to be clarified in the coming days after today's federal election is whether or not Trudeau intends to use his second Second term with the Liberal government as a second chance. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. Joining us now in studio here is Nigan Sinclair. He's Anishinaabe from uh, St. Peter's Little Peguas and an assistant professor at the University of Manitoba in Native Studies. He's also an award-winning columnist for the Winnipeg Free Press and many other publications. He's well known for his insight on issues affecting Indigenous people across the country. And Mumala Kaka joins us from Baker Lake. Thank you both for being here. Well, I guess we'll start with you, Mumala. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, 
And so what was the, I mean, when you found out you won, what's the first thing that enters your head? Um, it was a quiet when things are very important in my um, team, if you will. My parents, my brother, friends, and my best friend came later on after I found out. It was some. It was something that was so exciting. I think it hurt my parents first, and it has yet to come to me. Still, something I'm absorbing. So it's been it's been super interesting, and super fun. Well, I, I'm sure it'll hit you when you're on the plane heading to Ottawa. Uh, the whole gravity of it will come smashing down, right? Nigan, what, uh, as you were watching the results roll in across the country, were you surprised? Were you excited? Were you, what was going through your head? Well, I mean, I think this is the first election in Canadian history where all the leaders treated it as victory, <laughs> which is absolutely crazy because they all lost something on some level. Yeah. The, uh, the Greens, of course, tripled, but I think expected to do widely better. Yeah. Uh, the NDP lost 24 seats, but yet still treated it like a victory because they get to be a part of government. Yeah. Uh, the Conservatives have received relevancy again, are potentially in a position to have a uh, formal form government next time around. And the Liberals, while you would think would have tried to learn a lesson through all of this, acted as though nothing had happened and it was business as usual. And so it was a very weird election. But I would say there's so many different narratives that happened during this election that was interesting and intriguing. Uh, one is that we, uh, we saw more, uh, as much uh, Indigenous MPs elected as there was in 2015, mm -hmm. 10. Some people are reporting 11, but it's, it's 10. And so we've yeah. still got that kind of record amount that uh, Indigenous peoples are participating at an exponentially high rate, oftentimes beating most people in mm -hmm. their own constituency. And you're seeing this new, exciting leader leadership like Mamaluk, uh, like mm -hmm. Leah Gazan, um, and people, you know, young Indigenous peoples who are investing themselves in, in politics and are winning ridings with oftentimes yeah. many Indigenous, non-Indigenous people as well. Yeah. And so that's a, uh, in Winnipeg here, I mean, the election of Leah Gazan on my Facebook page alone or my social media page, just exponentially high. Like I've never seen so many people uh, joyous on election night. Yeah. Um, in many ways, this was not- And that's of course in Winnipeg Center is the constituency that Leo yeah. won from uh, Robert Falcon Ouellette, an indigenous MP who represented the Liberals for the past four years. Yeah, and so, uh, but you know, the, the, some of the most interesting things that are happening is, you know, for many reasons, for many reasons, indigenous people should be very wary and concerned about this election mm -hmm. because the government still owns a pipeline. They now have a absolute logjam with the situation in Alberta, where 100 percent of the uh, the seats are non-liberal, uh, one NDP, and the rest are uh, are conservative. And then, kind of throughout the prairies, there's this general feelings of sentiment and disenfranchisement, which we can't for, cannot forget led directly to the Reform Party. Yeah. And so, it, what it means is that the Conservatives are going to take a hard turn right, which naturally means uh, an anti-indigenous sentiment within the party. Well, and I guess we, I'll ask you, uh, Mumala, what do you think is the easiest thing to tackle once the government, ever, all the newly elected MPs, everybody converges back down uh, in, in Ottawa, what's the first thing, and easiest thing to tackle to kind of get things moving? I think something that's really important for for, for Indigenous people is that in order for us to have the same opportunity to be able to thrive and strive as all Canadians should, we need basic human rights here. We need to ensure that Nunavut has a roof over their head and a safe place to live in terms of not being in, in mold-infested homes, not in a crowded home, having food to eat every day and being able to have clean drinking water. We need to start, unfortunately, with the basics. That's mm -hmm. so unacceptable in Canada. And it has been like this for, for much, much too long. So in order for us to talk about opportunity and in terms of, of jobs, the economy, or post-secondary, or for our uh, communities and our people in Nunavut to be able to heal, we need to ensure that everybody has the base. So unfortunately, it's starting there. Well, and we haven't seen a government tackle this yet. I mean, well, lots of governments pay, pay lip service to it, but government after government, generation after generation, we're still living with the same problems, uh, particularly in Nunavut, up in the north, in remote communities. Nobody's tackled it. How do you make it happen this time? It's ensuring that nothing goes unsaid or undone. And liberals and conservatives have held the seat here in Nunavut since before I was even born. So now being able to, uh, and I love 
one of, one of the things I love about being uh, part of the New Democrat Party is I get to speak about our realities just as they are. I get to speak about things that are going on on the ground just as they are. The injustice that Nubumio and Inuit have faced has gone far too long with lip service, with apologies. With We have seen Trudeau come up multiple times in the last few months. At the end of election is what I keep saying to people. At the end, where was he four years ago? Where was that four years ago? Why is this only starting up now? So the federal government needs to ensure that it's not just lip service, it is action because we de deserve that. Your leader, Yagmeet Singh, he obviously has to represent interests across the country. Have you had a conversation with your leader and where does he stand on the concerns that you intend to be bringing forward as MP for Nunavut? Yeah, I have uh, talked to uh, Jag our party leader, Jagmeet Singh, who is phenomenal. I keep saying to people, imagine a colored man wearing a turban as prime minister. That is absolutely amazing. And although there are less seats uh, now than there were in the, in the previous government, it doesn't mean that things can't, we can't, we can, sorry, work together and be able to have an open and respectful working relationship with our party, with all different parties to ensure that Canadians that can progress and succeed together and Jagmeet is 100% uh, behind me and knows that injustice for Indigenous people for Inuit has gone on for far too long and too much lip service has happened without concrete action behind it. I'm curious to hear from both of our guests here what you think there was uh, AP10 had an Enveronics poll uh, in the weeks leading up to the election. It showed massive uh, loss for the Liberals in terms of Indigenous support. Indigenous people were off to vote for the Liberals in 2015. This time out, uh, that support they had indicated in the polling that they were going Conservative. Do we, A, is that surprising? B, do we think that actually happened? Or do we think Maybe while that support left the Liberals, it didn't actually translate into people going to actually vote Conservative. What, or what I'd like to hear from both of you guys. Well, uh, well I can go first. Um, it, the, uh, the idea that Indigenous peoples vote Conservative uh, is really indicative of a rural-urban divide. Yeah. And it's indicative, I think, of the most part of many urban, uh, oftentimes, there are First Nations, but many Métis people who are urban in places like Selkirk, Mm -hmm. uh, in places like uh, in Porters La Prairie, like mixed race people mm -hmm. who self identify as Indigenous, Metis usually, um, and think of themselves as small business owners, get out of my way kind of government people, mm -hmm. typical rural kind of Manitoba uh, in mentality, and they tend to vote conservative or liberal. Mm -hmm. um, so, what I would say is that that's a real indica indicative of like an on reserve vote tends to be uh, a left wing vote. And let's be clear. Uh, Indigenous people did not vote for for Justin Trudeau in 2015. They voted against Stephen Harper, and and what that means is is that uh, Stephen Harper had become such the kind of um, force to be reckoned with that we were we were we had just gone through I don't know more. We were engaged and interested in in the uh, the pipeline issue. Mm -hmm. Continue to be. Um, Indigenous peoples were voting against Stephen Harper to get him out, and Justin Trudeau was likely the best choice in that direction at right. that time. Um, and that's why they turned away from Tom Mulcair, and for the most part, which is where usually Indigenous votes tend to sit, mm -hmm. and they turned toward Justin Trudeau. Now this time around, I think Justin Trudeau led to a, a massive amount of overpromises, and let's not forget he's suing children. I mean, yeah. he is attacking Indigenous people um, while saying he, he promotes reconciliation, arresting them when they stand on the very lands in which they've been removed to. Yeah. You know, um, Justin Trudeau is not a good record, uh, whether it be the failures of uh, um, repairing all of the boil water advisories or whether it be uh, the failures of the murder missing indigenous women inquiry and the challenges that that faced or whether it be taking children to court such as the human rights tribunal uh, decision this was a campaign in which the Liberals didn't mention Indigenous peoples at the beginning and didn't mention them at the beginning, at the end either. Mm -hmm. uh, media mentioned it various throughout, and that's kind of encouraging, but generally the Liberals that's wanted to stay away from the issue. That's relatively new as well, isn't it? The, the media kept putting the question to him. I think I was surprised. I mean, well, we it was put the question to him, but that's, that would be an obvious one. But, you know, mainstream media, I think, too, was like... First election in history that Indigenous issues were ever a part of national debates. Yeah. First time ever. We even had a debate in which the Prime Minister was not present and the other parties, that was the McLean's uh, debate, mm -hmm. where the other leaders talked about Indigenous issues. And, and I mean, when has that happened? So. Yeah. Uh, Mumula, I'm just curious, do, do you feel that a lot of uh, Indigenous people got behind your leader in this campaign and voted NDP? Yeah, I think um, with what we've seen Trudeau do over the last few years, 
has been uh, a lot of uh, a lot of talk and not a lot of concrete action. A lot of people were behind uh, judging. A lot of people didn't even know I was the candidate and decided to vote me. Which it's it's encouraging that people are starting to get behind that understanding that you're not also you're not just voting for me. You're also voting for a uh, party and the party leader as well. So it's it's been great, and I think people really take to heart and see that uh, NDP our platform is. It was over. It's sorry. It's over. It, uh, sorry, it's over ten pages long. It's the most in-depth platform compared to the other parties. Liberals is about six paragraphs, and even then, there's nothing that concrete in there. Uh, and then conservatives, even less. If you have to dig around to find it. So I think it's it's important that Indigenous people are starting to get more engaged and more aware of how these political systems work because po politics affects every aspect of our lives. Uh, Nigan, I'll ask you, so you had mentioned uh, that Western separatist feeling that bread was the breeding ground for the Reform Party. The latest incarnation of the Reform Party, I guess, could be considered the People's Party of Canada, kind of ultra-right wing party. Maxime Bernier, the leader of that party, lost his seat. Where does that leave the party? Uh, I think they have no leg to stand on. They've been xenophobic since the, since the beginning and, and downright. Uh, their inclusion within the party is the perfect example of um, you know, how long did the Green Party have to fight in involving, I mean, they had five, six, seven, upwards in 10 and 12 percent this time around mm -hmm. of support, and they had to fight for decades just to be included in the debate, yeah. and one particular leader uh, simply becomes, because he has certain xenophobic views or certain views or has a presence in Parliament, I mean, there was no chance that anyone from that party was going to get elected, mm -hmm. especially in Quebec, uh, and the argument was, well, he could win his own seat. There was no chance because the bloc was uh, absolutely making a comeback in this mm. election. So his inclusion was really a black mark in this entire election. Um, so moving on then, I want to see that um, uh, Bob Nault, Liberal MP Bob Nault, uh, was up against Rudy Turtle in Kenora Rainy River. Uh, talk about vote splitting. Well, I mean, it reminds me a lot of the situation involving uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould as well. I mean, you know, like we're, uh, Rudy T Turtle was winning that race for a good hour plus, mm -hmm. and, and then I think probably what happened is there was a number of uh, urban, urban vote counts that weren't included until the latter parts of the evening and then, and then came up. But, uh, you know, the voting uh, of Jody Wilson-Raybould in is arguably one of the most exciting, interesting, and engaging. Like, for the first time in history, we have an Indigenous person part of Parliament who isn't attached to any party. Right. That means that uh, while she has always been a, a Kwakwa person, she is now uh, fully representing those interests as well as the interests of those in Vancouver Granville. But we've never seen that in history, so I don't know what it looks like. I think Canadian Parliament doesn't know to, to what to do with it, involving an Indigenous person representing uh, herself. Yeah. Uh, Mumala, I'm curious, your thoughts. Uh, I'm sure w you were busy, obviously, on election night too, but I'm sure when you had time to sit and look at the results and how it all shook down, you would have noticed Jody Wilson-Raybould's victory in Vancouver Granville. Where do you see her fitting into the, to the landscape now as an independent MP? Uh, just to echo what has already been said, it's going to be super interesting to see what that outcome leads to. Uh, definitely somebody I look up to, uh, somebody that is a powerhouse. Like, she is such a strong Indigenous woman. I'm so excited to be able to meet and work with her and so excited to see what is going to happen in, in the House of Commons moving forward and over the next few years. So uh, I'm, I'm just so excited for that. Uh, I'm curious too to know your thoughts on uh, Indigenous Services, former Indigenous Services Minister Jane Philpott, often viewed as an ally of Indigenous people, I guess depending on who you talk to or where she was, whether she was in Indigenous Services or if it was after that when she was on the side of uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould throughout this SNC-Lavalin scandal. She lost her seat. It was, what do you think, does, does that, is that a reflection of how she functioned as Indigenous Services Minister, do you think, or was it just pure par party politics? in uh, Markham Stofel. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, party politics uh, is a situation involving 
Uh, I mean, she was, for the most part, a person who was fronted by the Liberals, was seen as a large profile person within the Liberals, and then when you took away that large mechanism, that large money value, uh, they might, she would have to live on reputation alone. And because she was in a, a portfolio in which not a lot of everyday Canadians would have seen her work, yeah. uh, likely I'm not surprised that she lost that seat whatsoever. I mean, the number of people like Ralph, Ralph Goodale would be a similar example. Right. I, mean, I mean, Ralph Goodale's loss in Saskatchewan, I think, echoes that kind of blue wave that has emerged among the prairies. We're seeing it here in Manitoba in terms of the provincial government. Uh, right now, we can't forget that from Quebec West all the way to British Columbia are conservative premiers. Mm -hmm. And consistently, time and time again, fight carbon tax, fight the co even the concept of uh, climate change and, and whether that we should uh, talk about the environment and mm -hmm. then fight the Prime Minister on, on every issue involving um, d pr transfer payments, so health care payments. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest issues that's going to happen right now with the, tr with the attempt for the Liberals to try to create a coalition with the NDP is going to be they're going to have to find bridge issues but that's going to make them immediately in conflict with the premiers so let's say pharmacare for example immediately they're going to be in conflict with the premiers who want to have jurisdiction over that issue have control over that issue um, uh, let's you know, Jagmeet Singh was on the campaign trail talking about opening hospitals that's a provincial yeah, designation yeah. and so the whole idea that this is we can see an oncoming battle with premiers mm -hmm. very right-leaning premiers and then centrist left-wing uh, government uh, Mumala, what are your thoughts on a liberal uh, NDP coalition be uh, really uh, interesting opportunity to be able to do uh, amazing things. The last uh, time we saw the NDP coalition, we saw a bunch of things that came to for Canada. We saw that uh, healthcare played a big part. We saw a lot of big things. Happen. So I know uh, as long as the relationship is continuously open and respectful and those conditions are held up on, on both sides and that they work together and that we come from an understanding that we need to do that in order to help um, other, uh, all Canadians be able to succeed and, and progress. Uh, as long as uh, I think that can work, as long as Trudeau stops with the lip service and puts in action. I guess the pipeline is a mess that is going to be a tripping point probably. What are some of the easy things that if you have the Greens, the NDP, the Liberals, uh, all on the same side. What are some of the easy things that we can get off our plate quickly? Uh, well, I, I don't want to argue with you, but I would say the Greens aren't part of that equation. They, there's three, um, and while they, uh, they do have the most aggressive Indigenous platform, um, they, rec they will outright recognize Indigenous sovereignty, for example, and nationhood, whereas the NDP have sort of a limited, the typical Canadian lip, uh, centrist way of viewing it, which is that you're still under the control of Indigenous affairs and so on. Um, the, the number one issue I think they're going to find some collaboration on is small issues, like small step issues, okay. uh, like pharmacare. So pharmacare is going to be a big one. Um, uh, issues surrounding uh, things like national unity or situations involving, like I don't think you're going to see a challenge to the laws in Quebec involving religious wear at work, um, but you could see that. I mean, you could see an issue. I think that there's enough atmosphere within the country and within the Conservatives that the what's happening in Quebec in terms of xenophobia and the fears involving uh, racialized people is a very real threat and mm -hmm. it's something that, that I think the bloc itself wouldn't want to stand on and so that, so you might see some collaboration there but the real problems is going to be not so much going for issues but staying away from the major issues so that's why I've, I've predicted that this government probably will last 18 months unless somehow the Liberals can reach out to the Conservatives to get the pipeline issue approved, uh, the consultation mess that it is in uh, put forward or put through and and then somehow are able to put that put the shovels in the ground. Uh, unfortunately, that will involve uh, Indigenous peoples radically resisting, as we always have, mm -hmm. and that will result in a uh, um, yet another set of arrests, another set of conflict. And uh, this country is fearful and paranoid of having a true discussion on climate change, and is yeah. not ready for that. Is not. Why do you think that is? I mean, I, I we talk about that in the newsroom pretty frequently. 
there's that there is a lack of conversation. We hear it from indigenous people talking about we need action, but we don't hear you know average citizen. We hear about the carbon tax. People are either for it or against it. But why? What's standing in the way of an honest look at what we are all doing that contributes to climate change? Is it just that we don't want our lifestyles to change, and that's why we mm. pay lip service to caring about the environment without anybody doing something? Like what's? We, I think we all know that we're at a, at a crisis point, but there's not very much of a discussion of, that seems like it's, but we realize it's at a crisis. Well, probably the most interesting thing to me that's been happening in recent months has been the corporate community, that is the oil and gas industry, some of them, and particularly those in the financial sector, mm -hmm. have said, we want certainty on these issues. We want to understand what is it that we can and cannot do and therefore that will enable us all to benefit in long-term financial means. The problem, of course, is that there is no interest of the financial sector to act ethically when their company down the road doesn't have to act ethically, um, so, AKA uh, SNC-Lavalin, can get away with it and then the government protects them. Yeah. And that's the problem right now with certainty involving some sort of uh, ideas around climate change or carbon tax for that matter, mm -hmm. is that there's all these outs offered to the corporate world uh, for the most part due to fear mongering and that those outs are offered for the most part to deal with the, uh, the those who are contravening the laws, those mm -hmm. who are who are lying, who are cheating, who are interested only in profit and only interested in profit for one year and then they go out of business versus those in the financial sector who said no we want certainty yeah. because we want certainty for the next 15 years. So you're actually seeing the corporate sector also coming alongside not just uh, people who are activists and indigenous peoples like myself or or people who understand that climate change is a very real thing. So you get uh, the CEO of Suncor, for example, acknowledging climate change is a real thing, yeah. saying we need certainty on this. So just to clear that up in that, in that the government has an atmosphere in which this, this conversation could be had, but it is not having it for the most part because of money. And it's easy to, easy to identify that. There yeah. is so much money invested within the Liberal Party that supports oil and gas. Also, there is so much money that, with, that is within uh, various sectors of other lobby groups that are involved with the government that support oil and gas that are within other sectors as well, oftentimes some indigenous organizations as well. Yeah. That there is an atmosphere of fear mongering involving climate change. Uh, we're still at the point in which we're discussing whether it's real or not, which is exactly the problem. We only have approximately 18 months to stop the uh, half degree change that the uh, environmental organizations have warned us involving the rising of the seas, the end of polar bears, the mm -hmm. end of ice caps. And I'm sure no one can uh, speak to that more than... Uh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, you, Mumla, you've had your, your entire life as a front row to the effects of the, the climate is changing. And we, have, we all have a responsibility in that. Um, what do you see as the challenge for getting average Canadians to see, understand, care, and act? Where to begin? <laughs> um, there's three things that um, your day-to-day -day Canadians, if you will, that live down south don't understand. There, there are things like the steel hunt and that, that the steel skin white coat ban had a massive effect on her people, had a massive effect on families that relied on steel skin for incomes because it sent the market crashing down. Not being able to provide, um, not being able to be, sell their skins to be able to create income to be able to go hunting is something that's, that's huge. And it has been since that was put in place in, I believe, 1983, where we had Canadians sitting on hill dressed up as dead seals, like without understanding how this is impacting the first peoples of this country. We talk about polar bears, we're seeing them in part, particular communities coming closer and closer to town more frequently. Uh, there's a number of things that we're seeing new insects that we haven't seen before. Uh, a few years ago, we saw a moose in Nunavut. That is unheard of. We're seeing animals, mammals change their migration. Like there are so many things that are coming into play. We're seeing permafrost melt, we're seeing infrastructure being affected by that, we're seeing our waters being affected. There are so many things that are that are happening all at the same time. And it's hard for Nunukumu, for Inuit, for our hunters to be able to predict what one season's gonna look like to the next. So there's huge, it, we're being impacted in a very huge way. 
Thanks for that. Well, we've run out of time for this segment and we need to take a break. I thank you for joining us, Nigan. And Mumula, congratulations. I can't wait to see what you do as an MP for Nunavut. We'll be watching very closely. Thanks so much to both of you. We have to take a break, but when we come back, we've got um, a whole bunch of comments from you guys uh, on federal election results. And then we're going to head to the East Coast where Mi'kmaq harvesting rights are literally under fire. Stay with us. Hi, welcome back. Uh, so you guys had a lot to say on online about the elections. Uh, my name is Jesse Andrushko. I'm the social media editor. Let's see what you have to say. So from Jackie, as the numbers rose in the electron, I was thinking of the future of our children, uh, the land, the climate change, reconciliation, progress, if we had the wrong people in place to do the rightful work with good, honest integrity, to want healing for our people. I had so many thoughts flowing through my mind, my dinner burned in the oven, pacing back and forth. From Rachel. From Rachel. These results mean nothing to our families and communities. We agree to share the land, and we agree to go forward f following the two-row wampum, forever moving forward, separate without interference, Canada under party is still operating under racist doctrines like the Manifest Destiny because they haven't produced a bill of sale of international, uh, international level to show ownership of this land. There could be no reconciliation between society that kills and takes and a society that helps and gives. The First Nation viewpoint should be pro properly articulated instead of relying on assimilated positions that buy into land theft and genocidal institutions. Evans said, I voted expecting failure for, for Indigenous people. I think we need to drive the point home that not a single party has Indigenous freedom on their agenda, and the sooner we prove that, the, even the most progressive parties are not here for us, the better. Also, seeing Indigenous people treat each other like dirt for their choice to vote or not is disheartening. There are many strings that can be pulled to get things going to the right direction, but tearing each other down isn't one of them. And former Assembly of Manitoba, Ch Manitoba Chiefs Grand Chief Derek Nipanak says, My concern is that the political strategy to address Western Canadians' in interests in fossil fuel expansion will be ramped up as an effort to build popular Liberal support in the West. Appealing to the right likely means bringing st state violence to move fossil fuel infrastructure through unceded lands of the mountain and coastal Indigenous nations, Political expediency translates as violence against land defenders and others who resist the pollution and destruction caused by tar sands expansion. And lastly, from Linda, I think for the next election, we need to do a strategy and adhere to it. There, are, there were so many seats that could have been, gone to Indigenous candidates who, for many reasons, would have had a strong voice at Parliament, but many of our people were divided in their votes often voting for the white person because they were given a handout in the past. I'm not judging handouts, but as many of our people live in poverty, but we have to do some critical thinking in how we vote. Wow. Thank you all for your response. Uh, if you want to join our conversation, here's how. Join our conversation now. Call in toll-free at 1-877-647-2786. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN in Focus, or send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. Now we go to the East Coast, member to First Nation, where a team of fishers were harvesting lobster under a feast cer uh, social ceremonial license as per their rights. They were looking for 400 lobster to feed the Mi'kmaq community of 1,700 on Cape Breton Island, but some took issue with this. First they went for the traps, then they went for the boat. CTV's Kyle Moore has details. I feel definitely that we're targeted. Hubert Nicholas is the director of fisheries for Member 2 First Nation. He says a fire that destroyed this fishing vessel belonging to his community is the result of ignorance and miscommunication. We have significant damage, over $300,000 vessel being burnt. We had 100 traps that were cut that cost a band $10,000, and this is over 400 pounds of lobster. Nicholas says fishers were setting traps with what are called food social ceremonial tags. Their catches provided to community members that cannot exercise that right and not for commercial use. It's very frustrating. It's something that I've uh, reiterated to DFO plenty of times is that they need to do more to educate the wider community on what our rights are. When we try to exercise our rights, this is what happens. 
John Paul was the captain of the burned out vessel. He's still in shock and is worried about what could happen next. So what's their next move? What are they going to do? You know, what, what are they going to do to me or my family? Are we in danger? Cape Breton Regional Police are not saying yet what started the fire, but say they are working with the fire marshal's office to try and determine a cause. Just get to the bottom of it, you know what I mean? I just hope the guys that did it get caught and get prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. For now, Paul says he's working on getting a new boat and will be setting more traps in the coming weeks. We'll always keep fishing. I mean, this is, was a food fishery, so we'll keep fishing under food fishery. We'll keep supplying food to the community. And until, until you know, we, we felt like we had enough, we have given enough to the community, then we'll stop. That fire happened on the early morning of October 12th. Captain John Bonham Paul says it's not the first time there's been trouble between Indigenous and non-Indigenous fishers in Cape Breton before. This is just the most recent incident. Uh, he thinks that the culprits lack understanding of Mi'kmaq fishing rights and need to get educated. I had the chance to talk with Captain John Bonham Paul earlier. So what's been going on? How long has this been going on with people you know, vandalizing uh, traps or, or in boats? Well, for me personally, I mean, started eight years ago with these guys. Oh, you know who these people are? I'm not 100%, but uh, I'm pretty sure. Eight years ago, I set my gear in the same spot for the same uh, fisheries. There's a big altercation out there. Uh, a couple boats around at my boat. They're all cursing and swearing at us, get our gear out of the water. And uh, they even told us, oh, we don't want to... Just get your gear out of here. We don't want to start. We don't want to have to have a war. We don't want to see boats get burnt and stuff like that, eh? Wow. So that day there, I just managed. I just waited till I had an opportunity to get out. There was four boats kind of surrounded my one boat, the one that burnt, mm -hmm. which is actually the member two vessel. It's not my personal vessel. It's from my community. So, I mean, pr presumably the investigators uh, know this that this threat would have been made. Uh, has there been any progress in the investigation that you've been aware of? Well, I just gave a statement to the police yesterday, Cape Breton Regional, and uh, not really sure where it's at other than that. My understanding is that there had been some incidents prior to this too involving traps. Can you explain that? Yeah, well, um, even 11, uh, eight years ago when I was telling you about, there was 45 traps that went missing then. And then this year, on August 30th, we went out and we set 100 traps to feed the community. And within 18 hours, they were all gone, either cut or stolen. So you had said that, you know, there were some problems eight years ago, and then this popped up again in August, and then now uh, had escalated to the boat fire in October. What, there was, a, was there calm in between the eight years ago and then what's happened? Well, I never, uh, for the eight years, I never went back out to practice my uh, fishing rights. I just left it alone after that incident, as you know what I mean? How many people uh, are lobster fishers out there from member two? Uh, right now, it's just me. Me and uh, a couple guys that were working the deck for me. Do you th is the problem with uh, like does this does this happen during the regular lobster season? Are there problems with non-indigenous lobster fishers, or is this specific to uh, the food and social and ceremonial license that you guys have been? Yeah, using? it's not so much during the regular season. During the regular season, it's just the little things like hauling your gear, you know. They don't actually cut it and stuff, well, they might, but, yeah, in the regular season, it's just, uh, it's not as bad, it's just, uh, they might haul your gear here and there, but that's about it. When they see you out there practicing your native rights and doing something that they're not allowed, that's what drives them wild, right? What do you think is going to happen next? Well, I, I got more tags, and my license is still good till the end of November, and, um, we're, we're working on, we're, there should be another boat put in the water any day now. We're just working on uh, getting security set up for it and stuff for a while. It's docked at the wharf and whatnot. Do you worry that this is going to escalate? I mean, if it was a boat fire this time, do you worry that it will escalate? Well, there's, yeah, I do, really, I do. Well, I even said that. I said, like, what's next? They're so desperate. Like, to burn a boat's a huge thing. It's like burning someone's house or their car, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. 
Like, what what are they going to do next? Like, are they going to be so desperate they're going to shoot at us, try to kill us? What are they going to do? So that's obviously something we will keep our eye on on the East Coast. It's time for us to take another break. When we come back, racial tensions involving ethnic minorities boil over at a school in London, Ontario. What's being done to quell the situation? Stay with us. Welcome back. It was a story that grabbed headlines in southern Ontario earlier this month. Oneida and Chippewa students and Middle Eastern students at Saunders High School in London, Ontario were on the brink of a all-out student war. Here's a story from our friends at CTV London that kind of explains what was going on. Parents, police and school officials from Saunders met most of the day Friday to discuss concerns over a number of reported fights. Parent Pamela Chris John wasted no time in pulling her daughter from Westmount Public School, which is next door. She's like, oh yeah, well, uh, fights happen on Monday. And I was like, what? Friday's meeting comes after the Oneida First Nation canceled school buses fearing for their children's safety. This video on social media shows an altercation between two girls in the Westmount parking lot across from Saunders. It doesn't appear to show physical violence, but some say racial slurs can be heard. Huge crowds uh, of, of people shouting obscenities, uh, stereotypical uh, remarks to uh, First Nations children. Students say there have been several fights between First Nations students and those of Middle Eastern descent. There's definitely some very stereotypical uh, slurs that are being thrown, like wagon burner. Tisa Kennedy was at Friday's meeting concerned for his younger siblings who attend Saunders. There's two groups that are in conflict with one another, I guess, and um, it's gotten to the point where it's become violent and dangerous and where lives can potentially be at risk. And uh, it's def I'm definitely not over-exaggerating when I'm talking about that because there has been threats of knives and guns. Some close to the situation tell CTV News tensions really began to flare up on September 30th, Orange Shirt Day. That's the day that students and staff are encouraged to wear orange t-shirts to help raise awareness of Canada's residential school program. It's reconciliation time and uh, what action is being taken to ensure the safety of, of all of our kids. The Thames Valley District School Board issued a statement saying it's committed to providing safe learning and working environments. There will be increased police presence before and after school. Joining me now is Daryl Chris John. He's a member of uh, Oneida. He was set, helped set up a community patrol at checkpoints uh, at entrances to the territory after several social media posts had left the community fearing that violence would spill from the school into their territory. And Imam Abal Fatah Twakal from the Muslim Resource uh, Center for Social Support and Integration in London, Ontario. I thank both of you gentlemen for joining us. So this is uh, apparently it wasn't a new issue that was going on uh, most recently. This kind of there's been tensions building up over some amount of time. Uh, Imam, I'll start with you. What's uh, what was going on there? So uh, when the incident first happened um, between you know two students, um, really that's how it started as a, as an incident between individuals, um, and then when they they brought their respective network of friends and whatnot, um, then it it came to be. Uh, viewed as between two groups. Now we know that in high schools um, these types of incidences happen mm -hmm. um, all the time in terms of fights between uh, two students and sometimes uh, it's it's more than two groups. It's not necessarily limited to happening between one group or, or another group uh, but this is something that um, comes out as being um, sensationalized um, often enough and so we need to take steps in order to be able to help create a culture um, of understanding and, and respect um, for all uh, people and for all uh, diverse uh, ethnicities that uh, exist or people of diverse backgrounds uh, within a high school setting. Absolutely. Daryl, this the community took this very seriously. I mean, lots of times we hear things, people say things on social media and it sounds uh, you know, worrying. Your community uh, set up checkpoints as a result of threats that were made on social media to the effect of burning down the community. Uh, you were on those, on those patrols. Uh, what were there people that were trying to come to the community? Yes, there was. There was um, 
I believe 11 o'clock uh, Friday, the day of the school was shut down early. Um, I was notified by Ontario Provincial Police um, that there have been three um, numerous threats to the CMO area, which we call Chippewa, Muncie, and Oneida. Mm -hmm. And I was asked by the OPP um, to get uh, peacekeepers out and uh, help assist and to protect our territory. See, at that second that I got the call, I made a few calls to our guy peacekeepers and we were out on the road immediately. Um, I went to the school. Um, by noon hour, we had um, parents um, sending their kids up to the uh, principal's office. We did have a counselor there from Oneida that really didn't do much to help and assist in any of the situations because we had some about eight young girls that was coming from uh, downstairs. They're apparently, their parents called them and told them to go to the office and stay there. And uh, the kids kept building up. And then I went to the principal's office when I got there, and I just notified the principal, please get a room. For my, for my students and I, I would appreciate it if we had a buses and let's get my kids, let's get all of our kids home safe at this minute. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what, the, that's what actually took place at that time and then uh, um, everything when we got back to the territory, it was just, uh, we had to shut it down. We made checkpoints and we were checking cars, vehicles and the whole weekend that we were there from Friday, um, the band council didn't really assist in any way. They kind of diminished the whole issue by sending out a letter saying, oh, it's just threats by teenagers and um, um, just let the OPP handle it. But nobody knows, even in Oneida, a lot of the residents still don't know that the OPP came to me at 9 Friday night p.m. and they told me, happy Thanksgiving, Daryl. We're out here. We won't be back till Tuesday. And you had said that there was cars that had been turned away, people who aren't members of the community who had been turned away at the checkpoint. I guess since that's happened, um, I would like to hear from both of you. Uh, Imam, we'll start with you. What sure. is, what's your community's feelings, thoughts about how the school has handled this? So, I mean, the, the school has a responsibility to be able to ensure that our children are safe. And mm -hmm. we have to understand that that is absolutely a priority. Um, they, they have reached out to members within the community, both um, from the indigenous as well as from uh, the, the Muslim and Middle Eastern uh, communities, uh, and to be able to, to find the most effective way to help uh, quell um, some of these tensions. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, really, it's more about um, taking steps forward to creating um, an environment that uh, is respectful um, mm -hmm. for, for everyone. Uh, and, and that's something that is, is a continuous effort. Yeah, I, and that's something that doesn't come overnight, of course, is to understand where people, uh, people's histories, where they come from, and what Absolutely. makes them who they are now. And I think that, in, that education yes. will be an integral to putting this behind us. Daryl, what are your thoughts uh, how the schools handle this and the community in general? Are both communities working together to, to solve this, this ongoing problem? For me, myself, personally, the school didn't really do too much. They're actually still to this day haven't done anything at all. The provincial police, the Ontario provincial police, the London police still haven't done nothing to this day. Um, as far as I understand it, it's between a jurisdiction issue is why there was no charges laid on the actual threat in mm -hmm. the first place. And uh, I, just, I just think that there's, there's nothing being done from the school or our um, elective council from Oneida. Nothing has been done. They downplayed the whole issue, sent all our kids back on Monday after we made a big deal the police and the band council sent letters out and stuff like this and then all of a sudden Monday the kids are allowed to go back in school with nothing had took place within that time even still to this day as we're speaking now all they come up with is they want to meet with uh, with their 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 families they want to meet with our kids families they want to meet with the school like as far as I understand that should have been done over a month ago when this issue actually first started and as far as the understanding reconciliation these individuals um, have to understand there are visitors to this land. This is our land. They are also visitors to this land. Just like anybody else under the two-row wampum, they had to adhere to these issues that we have. And it's not just for non-natives, blacks, Chinese. It's for all of them that come to our lands, that come here, that set foot on our lands to live. They have to understand they are visitors on our lands. Is it time then that we get the parents involved? Maybe that's what has to happen. The students, the parents, maybe cut the school out of it, but uh, just get the communities involved to sit down and deal with this. Or is that happening? That's not happening. They say it's happening, but behind the closed doors, like I said, there's not a thing been going on to this day. Imam, it's are, are you seeing right any of any movement towards this? Everybody so getting together? Been, 
Yeah, I mean, there have been uh, definitely concerned community members um, uh, that have gotten together just to, to begin this conversation in terms of what steps we can take to, to move forward. Uh, we do acknowledge that we are all treaty people and that we are all uh, living on lands um, that have been taken unjustly. Uh, and uh, this was actually uh, part of one of my sermons that I delivered um, two weeks ago uh, to indicate that we do have an obligation towards the indigenous peoples of this land uh -huh. um, and through right. some of the uh, recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Report that was published in 2015. Uh -huh. um, and so I did speak uh, to this matter publicly uh, within my community just to indicate the need to be able to understand more about some of the injustices that have taken place um, and that we, we need to take steps towards reconciliation. That's in fact, uh, two, two years ago, um, right now is October, we're in Islamic History Month, and two years ago the theme of Islamic History Month across the entire nation was honor, celebrating diversity and honoring reconciliation. I'm going to have to cut you off there. I thank you both for joining us. This was a, I like this conversation very much. Thank you so much, and we hope that this is the beginning of the end of tensions there. I'm Melissa Ridgen. That's all the time we have for our show. Tune in next week for an all-new In Focus. Have a great afternoon.